Welcome. This is the August 30th OpenZFS production users call. We so far have Andrew, Jan, myself, Michael, Stu, Alexander, and Stefan. Perhaps some more will trickle in. And to kick off, Stefan had a very interesting question, which was, is there a way to have a ring buffer style, perhaps data set, and I'm guessing a bit like RRD, that drops the oldest data by some criteria? Stefan, would you like to describe your use case? Um, so we've been using ZFS uh, to <clears throat> um, host some legacy software for quite a while now. And it's, uh, it's some rather touchy software and we'd rather not modify a whole bunch of code. And it tends to create a lot of temporary files, but forgets to clean them up. Um, so we have things that sort of sit to the side and periodically scan and clean those up. And I was just looking for uh, maybe a more foolproof way and thought that might exist either in um, some other Linux utility or possibly within ZFS itself. So that said, uh, do they follow a consistent like naming and date stamp so that you could just have a, a Reaper process in the, as a glorious shell script that could clean those up? Or is there something unique about them that, that you'd want it to be handled at the lower level? Um, they, most of them do follow a pattern. Uh, they, they're mostly contained actually within one directory. So, I mean, that makes it easy. I'm, I'm really looking for, hey, any file that exists in this directory that's maybe uh, two or three days old can just go away. Just fine tool can search on any timestamp, on creation, on access time, on, yeah. on, on anything. And then it's trivial to pass its output to any tool or like XRX if you want to delete them or just list them. Is your first may find delete. So we we have we are using those types of uh, solutions. Um, to, um, I was I'm kind of just looking for something possibly a little more a little cleaner and that doesn't require something running to the side. Well, let's explore. Uh, Jan, you were saying you could use iNotify on Linux to find out which new files have been created, and then add them basically to a new and have a daemon running which just consumes those events that the files have been created and then you don't have to scan the file system again but it's still an ugly rock around uh, the proper solution of course is to fix the broken software mm -hmm. but if legacy from a company it's probably out of business is the assumption but um as a group are there other use cases perhaps you know, logging or other things where we may in fact want the file system to expand um, old data, hypothetically? There is a curious corner case with software which uh, cannot rotate its log file. Some broken software out there exists which is written in such a way that it refuses to write to anything but a normal file and it can't rotate uh, the file. So basically you have an always growing log file. And for that, uh, I think it was first implemented on XFS to support such broken applications, but it's now supported by several file systems, including ZFS, where you can retroactively come back and punch a, a hole in the beginning of a file, releasing the data which was stored there. And that was log or lock? Log. Log, okay, Logging. Got it. Thank so you. let's imagine a terribly written Java application writing several megabytes of stack traces per minute to a, a log file. I, I think in the last couple of weeks, there was some uh, feature request for ZFS to support some magic uh, syscall on Linux to be able to delete part of, uh, like, part at the beginning of file. 
not exactly punching a hole, but literally dropping part of a file and sh- shifting ev- everything back. But, uh, I think it was it was told to be supported by several other file systems, but not ZFS. I personally never heard about that syscalls before. That syscall, mm-hmm. I don't know how much standard it is, but it may be kind of related to the topic. Interesting. Problem but... of supporting the... Uh, so there's the difference between basically turning it into a sparse file where you have implicit zeros we're taking the place of whatever was there at the beginning of a file and really basically shifting the remaining content to the beginning of the file where now you need a kind of offset. So you need a basically an offset more in your uh, inode type so that you basically can have an offset for the allocation. No, well, it's it's not uh, offset. That... It was literally like... Uh, like... Oh, they m- oh, move the data? No, like if you I could remember... do surgery on the level of block pointers. You don't, you don't need to move actual data. You could just lock exactly, a file, but... uh, change all the block pointer and call it a day. But obviously it should be yeah. aligned to, to blocks, but otherwise... I think the XFS implementation even avoids that because they have a B tree, so it doesn't hurt for them to have a offset. They just inc- have a basically an offset for the zero position of the file inside the file, uh-huh. hmm. uh, which requires a change to the on disk format of every file, which is why it's hard to re- retrofit. But my what main question to that, go ahead, Matt. Uh, my main question to that was how much software is able to use this feature. Like it, I was told there could be some video editing or something like that, but I'm a bit suspicious. Like how much applications can get used to like uh, ZFS 138 kilobyte blocks, not page size at all or something. So one use case for this is something like a container runtime, like uh, Docker, Nomad, whatever, where they want to write, basically capture the last few screens worth of st- standard log and standard error from an application to a file. And uh, it would be neat if they could basically have a sliding window of the last, let's say, megabyte or so of the file. Hmm. So that you could go back, and but and still only one file instead of having to run a command to piece together the rotated log file snippets. That's kind of the only halfway sane use case I know for this. You'd still have a usable file because this sounds like a great way to auto-corrupt data for you. Yes, you do have a... This is for human readable log output, something like all the debug printers and so on, which have been left in and you, and the application doesn't behave and you just want to basically, if I had executed with, with this in Tmux and I read to page up and down mm-hmm. to so that you can always have this. Hmm. Well, yeah, it's just pro- I see a problem how to read that file. You cannot trust any offsets in it. You have to read all of it in, in once in one request. You or may probably you write could, it in uh, append let me, let me mode. Finish. Ah, you can probably write it in append mode because you don't need offset. Yeah. You set offset to minus one or whatever. But you can't read it. You can't p read it. You can still read it sequentially. Uh, like it, but you, you could you, still you, use you, relative you re- seeks. You can't use absolute seeks. But will the offsets change? Uh, for example. I read first 128 kilobyte in in one request. I'm trying to read next 128 kilobyte. By that time, some other threads deleted something under me. What will I read? <laughs> Nobody knows. I I remember correctly, you uh, if you try to read the deleted parts of the file, you read zeros. No, or you will read something with offset of 100 or whatever was oh, deleted. Oh yeah, when you have uh, the data corruption you're worried about. So it would be interesting, of course, to look what uh, Cisco ZFS could implement. I guess on FreeBSD we could look, at, or maybe on BOSS platforms, we could look more on some cache cache control. I don't know what software use that, but something like will need, will not need, and things like that, so sequential random access. Uh, 
I, I know that on FreeBSD is very little yeah. is implemented. On Linux, maybe some more, but maybe even more could be implemented. I was just recently slightly yeah, thinking about prefetch. Yeah. POSIX F advice, right? Yeah, sure. Do you drop in any links to examples on other platforms you have, operating systems, RRD, special databases? It's, a, it's an interesting idea. Um, what that should look like, it's hard to say. And Mav, do you, re, do, do you have a link to that feature request? If that's handy, go ahead and drop it. I in. don't link it. I don't have a link. It, okay. it was on the, in the last few weeks on issue requests on OpenZFS. Okay, cool. Um, let's see where I put that request. So that would have been on the GitHub repo. Yeah. Okay, cool. So maybe we can find that after the meeting. Okay, anything else on that topic? And Stefan, does that sound like what you're hoping to achieve? Um, I would say my use case is more small file related, but many small files. Uh, um, so not one large log that's being sort of eaten and created at different ends. Correct. Um, do you have the in-house ability to further refine your finds and other sort of blunt instrument approaches to that? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, like this okay. isn't, um, this isn't something that I need so much as I was curious about. I thought maybe I was missing, you know, just an obvious uh, flag or something like that. Well, what would be ahead. really cool is if we could do it actually in an arc. Um, and just keep it all in memory and then use that, use RRD the way it was meant to be. How about using ZFS diff? If you snapshot the file system. Interesting. Um, Basically do an anti-snapshot. No, um, you do a snapshot and then find out all the files added and try to delete right, them. The, right, but the function would be remove anything that's not, that is in the snapshot. Yeah, but but that could just be an X arc. <laughs> You're still right. using an external tool. It is fascinating to say that, it, and it, it's terrifying, but uh, this data set does not contain files after a certain date, set in a property, and just read them, delete them, I even if they're without them being the... preserved in snapshots. But you know, it has its risks, but it is somewhat fascinating. Yeah, you know, you... Expire, expire in one day or expire in 16 hours. Uh... You can't do that to remove a file without breaking the snapshot because ZFS forms a hash tree. Correct. So you can't really remove a file from snapshots without corrupting the snapshots. Well, you might actually want the snapshots to do their job and preserve history exactly. when it comes to that, and then you age them out as you would normally. So they will eventually be consistent should nothing change. But, but yeah. The kind of logical snapshotting would be an interesting feature, which could also become uh, more important with data protection regulations, where you have to be able to punch holes into your snapshot. The right to be forgotten snapshot redaction. Exactly, that so kind or just... Yeah, no interesting. Or it doesn't have to be this legal leasing. It can actually be... I don't want to have child porn in my backup mechanisms. If you host user-generated content and someone uploaded something disgusting you don't want to host, mm -hmm. uh, right now you basically would have to write, um, wipe out every snapshot afterward and create a parallel reality where it never happened instead of being able to Oh, yeah, uh, really not necessarily. Um, I mean, if you make your file system not be directories within the file systems, but be sub file systems with recursive snapshots, then you can just remove the snapshots that have the offensive yeah. material. 
Yes, and I know that I picked the uh, <laughs> extreme example. I get it. I have a real-world example. Someone filled that combined their ISO images with the important data and needed a year of retention such that I created a script to recreate snapshot history, although it doesn't have the correct internal date stamps and has a correct naming to <laughs> be the same data without those big clunky ISOs that are far larger than everything else I care about. So we, the, the, the problem exists in many forms and that is fascinating about you know, what can and can't be done um, but yeah, yeah. Stefan, does file expiration sound like what you're describing? Um, it it probably does. Um, I was thinking that it doesn't even, in my case, it doesn't even need to be file based. Um, for instance, I might I might say. I only want to spend 500 megs on this directory and I just want the, the blocks to disappear. Okay, uh, you want an extreme log structured file system. I didn't catch that last comment. Uh, extreme uh, log file. A true ring, ring oh, buffer sorry. file system. Okay. Well, yeah. That's where he started, yes. But uh, the question is, What's the granularity of uh, releasing old uh, files? So basically, are you deleting all files in your proposal or just the contents of old files suddenly become unknowable slash zeroed or what happens if? That is a good question. I didn't think of that. But basically, when the first block of fi the file gets dropped, the whole file becomes uh, unaddressable in a way that basically you have a logically on your disk structure, you have a file header before the file so that the file header always gets uh, released as first uh, entry to be reused or how would that look? It, it, especially, it wouldn't be a, a proper uh, hash tree so it would be a completely different data structure from how my understanding of ZFS looks internally. Right, and I, I suspect that would lead to some complications. Um, a file-based approach would probably be would probably fit more like what users would expect and it would solve the problem. Yeah. Yep. But it would be a very specific solution to exactly your problem of, I have mm -hmm. this misbehaving application and I want to lie to it in such a way that the result makes sense to the application users and the application logic. Yes, I, I agree. And I'm, I'm not super like I'm not excited about creating a something that's very specific um, to the extent that there would have been something in ZFS already that sort of approached it. That would have been great. Um, but yeah. a related question: I know that ZFS has some is it ring buffers, perhaps for pool status or other status information that may get flushed out if you're not careful. I don't know if they're saved to disk, but there might be mechanisms related to that. The zpool history is a ring buffer, I believe, or at least a quasi ring buffer. I think the early stuff doesn't get flushed out, but like some of the middle stuff does. That's a key question because I've always had the creation history, but yeah, okay, uh, great thing, exactly. Uh, uh, So I, I do have another yeah. topic. Like this one to me was a curiosity. Um, I actually am running into something you guys mentioned about redaction of large files in um, automated snapshots. And so uh, just, I don't want to get in front of anybody else's question, but Go for I it. did hear that. 
no nope. discussion go for it uh so we are we are also um running snapshots um for sort of recoverability and uh ease of access of of data as it has changed over time and that's that's been really great uh, what happens is though that we we do have some security considerations of um, things that that kind of need to be excluded from the snapshot and then there's also wasteful things that are in the snapshots uh, to some degree we've pruned that out using like data you know child data sets and that's worked pretty well um the one that i run into is we have um a subdirectory that has not been allocated into a data set and it's filled with documents and so a lot of times i want to do a send receive and um, I have to bring along about, you know, I, I don't know what they, you know, for a typical environment, maybe it's, it could be like an extra hundred gig or something. Um, so it's not terrible, but it's like, I, I wound up exploring redaction in order to, to kind of, um, not have that expense. And that's and, purely for a send or for just preservation in place. Um, my pain point is I want to replicate this thing somewhere else yeah. in order for testing and that type of thing. Yep. And I really don't need all of those things, yep. um, but it would be, it would actually be a little risky to create a, a sub data set or a child data set. Okay. For Did my would it be risky? send not help you? Um, it, it did. Um, I'm curious though, if I'm like using redaction for something that there's clearly a better way. Jan, was that yeah, you? I, I have this, I have the same question Jan had. W why would it be risky? Uh, maybe risky is not the right word. Um, it, so I, I have people that take care of this stuff. Um, and I'm sort of their ZFS expert. Um, and I just have a feeling that if I keep the data set whole, um, I will likely have less problems. I know that I know that like the auto snapshotting and like everything will work if I put if I create a sub a child data set for that um, document directory. Um, but I'm nervous. I'm nervous that it's going to get left out of a snapshot or nervous that it'll get, uh, left out of a restore or things like that. So I haven't, I haven't, uh, made that decision yet. Although I, I flirt with that decision every year, like, Hey, you know, you guys need so, to. Yeah. Um, in that case is. One idea I still have would be to leave the Z pure ZFS world and use something like Rustic to uh, get a more malleable backup on a file level of the snapshot. So you still take a ZFS snapshot and then you back up the snapshot using an other snapshot-based backup tool. The downside is that you don't preserve all the finer points about the file system, but you preserve the file content and so on, permissions, modification times, but you don't preserve things. Uh, the backup software can't preserve like the ZFS-specific proper uh, data set properties and so on. It also means the restore process is whatever this third-party tool would be rather than doing a ZFS receive. Yes. Exactly. But you can, of course, also feed it a ZFS stream if you want, but then you have only a single stream and it's not 
pure ZFS anymore, yeah. Does that help? Sorry if I jumped in. But uh, for this use case of basically taking a snapshot, backing up what you want to keep, and then restoring it in some test environment, where you basically don't care about the, these finer points and the exact reproduction of your old state, but only the, this is how the file system looked at in the snapshot. Uh, yeah, then it could be very useful and So yeah, no, I'll look into let's that. broaden this to simply redaction strategies because ZFS does give you some tools intended for that purpose, but that is fascinating that there are, well, risks for lack of a better term, and maybe desired features like automatic sponging. Yeah. Um, go ahead. This is the only way within ZFS data model to retrofit this, I can imagine, is to have a kind of overlay in the read path, you would erase the old data and then have a kind of white out, which then tells the FS, yeah, it's okay that this data is, this block pointer is broken. And this is a known bad reference here that you have a, this isn't a corruption, this is intentional. And Push to an extreme, maybe you preserve the expiration in snapshots and ZFS itself refuses to hand you back what is past a certain date, either by, I wouldn't say re-encrypting it or doing something, but wouldn't just thinking out loud here. Legal requirements. Hmm. Because for some of the root permission, there's always a way to turn this conditional branch into a knob. Hmm. Other thoughts on this topic? Well, the thought okay, of trying a situation to situation where you have to do this. Yes, Andrew. Yes, avoid this. Let's say the thought yeah. the, in general, the thought of trying to muck about with what's happening in a snapshot under this under the scenes makes me super nervous. Mm -hmm. Exactly, which is why I wouldn't even dare touch this. But uh, basically, what have a kind of similar to our deduplication works, you would have a, a set of block pointers and transaction ID ranges or something where basically you have a known this don't go in this into these subtrees. And the reason to be clear, the reason it bothers me is that you're intentionally breaking ZFS ZFS's guarantees. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. All of the data uh, integrity guarantees uh, of the formal model go out of a window. Um, so I ha I am using redaction, and that does give me. Um, it, it it works. I would say it works for like sixty percent of what I need, and then I I just haven't learned enough about redaction yet. Um, I think to um, like just be super comfortable with it. So uh, redaction might be enough uh, for me. I do have a, another question. I I've still I don't want to hog the the oh, session. Man. Go ahead. <laughs> so uh, this is about it's kind of, of about redaction. But if you could think about a set of automated snapshots, um, you know, I don't know. Like a lot of times I have like a hundred plus automated snapshots that happened on a data set. And those snapshots are very valuable to me in setting up um, tests against the data set as it's changing. So I can sort of simulate some legacy software things and um, step through those things. So it's, it's nice for uh, creating sort of data simulations. Okay. Um, now, the, the problem is a lot of times my test is, is specific and doesn't need huge chunks of the data. 
and I didn't have enough foresight, you know, months and months ago to um, exclude, say, that document directory. So now under this scenario, it's less about send and receive, and it's more the use is I would like to be able to rebuild my snapshots and exclude some things from the snapshots. And I'm not entirely sure if that's possible. I, um, and, and it's still got a script to do that for getting those ISOs out of the bookkeeping data. So yeah, but I'll try to dig that up while parallel multitasking here, but. So it is possible. It's just, it takes, um, put it somewhere temporary, snap it, and delete the original, but go ahead, Jan. Couldn't you uh, basically take the oldest version you want to preserve as is, which could be the, uh, then they do the modification or take the oldest snapshot, do a ZFS redact did send, mm -hmm. and then ZFS diff, apply the diffs, and recreate the part of the history you want to create. Because the, you're just describing that ZFS intentionally can't do this because it wants to preserve your integrity above uh, <laughs> giving you the ability to uh, delete or release old data. Because then you can no longer trust that your system can restore it from a snapshot. Mm hmm Basically, it doesn't give you this foot gun to even blow up your uh, own two feet. Right. Just because it's nice and shiny. Yeah. And, uh, and it, from a value standpoint, um, I would never want to suggest a feature that would uh, lead to something, you know, like that. Um, what I'm just trying to make sure is that you know hey this is this is possible maybe using a different feature and i'm i'm you know what i'm hearing is it's kind of not um you mentioned a script that you're gonna yeah, send I'm, i've just booted up the system i'll try to find it okay so, yeah. and but you're basically recreating an alternative uh, history right yes and key point keeping the the exact snapshot names of the original history, but internally it will have a you know, date stamp of like today, but still it's it, the one could explain yeah, okay. their rationale for doing so. I'll see what that, I can do. That could be very helpful. Thank you. Oh, of course. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, do, do you have a fourth one or have you covered some, your ground? <laughs> Uh, I'm good for now. Thank you. Hey, and th th one absolute key point is that there are so many different variations here such that, oh, no, we do not want to upset you know, the, the EU governments or, oh, it's testing data. We just want it more conveniently and more, to be faster by ignoring a whole bunch of things. So there's, a, I'm sure, a case for the <clears throat> super safe and super uh, quick and dirty approaches. So. Uh, Mav, it sounds like you have good news about your Zill patch landing and anything else to report? Yeah, as I started saying that I finally was happy to see it landed upstream and was merged down to 2.2. Okay. Number of people tested it on uh, FreeBSD science. It was affecting uh, package built systems on a cluster and in respect of 14 release uh, coming, it was a big deal. So it was com committed, merged, number of people tested, so far so good, nobody ever complained. So hopefully it should fix all those deadlocks. Apparently they were now on FreeBSD for a couple of months, but nobody uh, cared to uh, report it to OpenZFS and I never saw the ticket. So I just- Wouldn't be the first time, I understand. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Is 2.2 expected to land in 14? Yes, that's a plan. Uh, so uh, as I understand, uh, no, Martin, thanks to him, uh, Martin Matushka merged yeah. uh, master in ZFS master into FreeBSD main uh, last week. And it's cool to have it 
updated. At least for me, it's good for my development. I'm used to develop it that way. And uh, 2.2 should be merged uh, before a release. So now branch, branching happened. There was found a problem with library Liberty line uh, laying in a, uh, in a different directory in user lib. So if somebody has user on different partition, they couldn't import pool. So hmm. that should be that part that fix it in, in master and should be merged into for stable 14 branch in a couple of days. After that, I guess Martin should be able to merge the FS update. At least I, I'm not aware about other showstoppers. That's the only one I saw in commit messages and commit emails. Okay. So remember... idea idea is that 14 will uh 14 stable will get 2.2 branch. No, at this point, it's 2.2. It's still not released. It's RC3 approach in RC4. Okay. But uh, Brian Bechlidorf promised it will be the last RC4 will be the last the last RC of 2.2 unless anything else happen. So I guess uh, he's collecting some uh, last parts here and there to just merge them, merge them, tag them, and hope it will be the day. But, yeah, always hard to predict. I hope this release would happen six months ago, <laughs> but uh, I'm okay to happen at all. Yeah. Oh, great work. Um, question related to that and the next topic, if we get to it. What uh, libzfs stability guarantees are there for the API? I mean, are you for, is a project like TrueNAS finding that it has to adjust its middleware every time there's a dot one release on or even major release? Or what, what, are, what are the guarantees in 2023? No, like uh, guarantees are not so big. Uh, ZFS CI on GitHub, as far as I know, tracks are big changes. So uh, there should not be dramatic changes, hopefully, since that was introduced but it's not exactly a stable ABI. I think okay. uh, there was a subset of uh, function functionality in uh, lib uh, ZFS core or something like that, but it doesn't cover mm -hmm. everything. And I, I haven't worked so much on libraries, I can say for sure. Um, if I yeah. understood correctly, uh, Michael asked about API, not ABI. Oh, it, oops, I, no, that's my typo that I gave myself here, but the Yes, the API for tools act, you know, relying on it. And I ask because uh, there have been several conversations this week about a possible tool. So first I want to get that out of the way. No, as I've told, I, I'm not working so much on uh, in user space on libraries directly, but as okay. I've told uh, that like, there are, should be some test in CI to check that uh, API won't change one thing. And second, in uh, in Trunas, we're using PyLibZFS on top of that, a set of wrappers. So if something changed, we at least have some layer to fix it. But okay. that's all we have. Um, what advantages do you get other than not forking a command line process from calling directly into libzfs instead of using the zfs and zpool commands so, primarily uh, primarily it's not forking um, okay so uh, uh, if we need to do a lot of operations uh, yeah. fork exec may becomes quickly becomes pretty expensive it does so, okay so it's mostly about performance yeah That is excellent to know. No, we have same uh, Pi uh, cam to, to, to talk to disks to get some smart information, temperature, and so on without calling smartphone tools and so on to take disk reservations mm -hmm. and some other functionality. We can't uh, yeah. call some SG3 utils for 1,000 disks mm -hmm. number of times. No, it doesn't work. Well, also, not within a reasonable time frame. Yeah, Python is obviously not a racer by itself, but still, it's better. Um, regarding uh, 
the interface between ZFS and CAM and CAM target layer especially. I've been messing around with VETO SCSI uh, for, to make ZVOLTs available to Beehive guests again. And that rocks, but right now the interface uh, the, using CTL admin is very clunky and where you basically have to allocate the port number manually and there isn't not, no such thing as here's the configuration, give me a port and I want it named like this so that I can basically have, what I would like to have is this is a port in its configuration, make it available under a sim link in dev uh, cam. So that with, uh, I can do it in a bit of shell scripting, but it, the command line interface is really not pleasant to script around with. Mm, and when I, I look into how it's implemented with libcam, it's all just raw SCSI and uh, or um, in complicated NV lists with no schema definitions. No, obviously there's no documentation, that's true. Uh, but I don't remember whether in IP of port creation who sets up port ID. Uh, uh, what side, happens is but... you create a port, it gets the new next three index. And you can set the physical and virtual port number, but you can't set something like the worldwide port number. Uh, and still, it's only the device node in slash dev is named after slash dev uh, cam CTL. And then if it's not the default device, it's physical port number dot virtual port number. Oh, yes, yeah, that's... Uh... I assume uh, that uh, should be quite, well, obviously it's not stable between runs, but you may still, you have the same num number in within CTL and user space, and you can correlate those. Oh, yes, but the problem is that the, you really have to write your own ad hoc parsers because not all commands even output XML, so, and then XML isn't really shell scripting friendly. So you end up with lots of, pipe and then while read something a bit of ad hoc parsing using shell built-ins i'd be happy to review proposals what can i yeah. say and i was just just wondering who the intended consumer of this api is of oh, the zfs one or ctl one the ctl one. Oh, so it has its own api Okay. Yeah. Well, let's save that perhaps for tomorrow's Beehive call. Cool. So uh, any other topics before I jump into this one? And I did find that script, but I need to clean it up a wee bit. So uh, maybe, uh, Stefan, I think it will drop your email in the chat there, and I'll try and get that to you. So. Uh, Jorgen has done the Mac OS port, and now the Windows port has long said, hey, we need a little Windows tray tool so that people can find it a little more user-friendly to actually test it. And he has a, a new release candidate coming out in a few days. He pointed me to a Mac OS-based tool that covers a lot of the ground, and I only learned that from him just like yesterday. But... Uh, there's a the general housekeeping that one would want of, say, scrubbing and mounting encrypted keys and decrypting and snapshots and some basic information. So that was inspiring. And in conversations with Antrenig and company, he's often on such calls, uh, he thought, you know, with uh, free, what was it? Free Pascal and Lazarus, one could bang out a basic cross platform tray for Windows, Mac, and XOR, not Wayland based Unix systems. And the, that gets us to the key question there should we use the, uh, the, the, the libzfs library for stability or, or for, for, I don't know, 
efficiency or simply map to commands using uh, whatever native uh, ZFS commands and the SQL commands are, which shouldn't vary much, but of course the device names and such would change. Now, uh, at this early stage, it's a question of, well, what would we want as the absolute minimum feature set? And here's Jorgen's comments on the use of, or the, the history and use of the API. And Zeta Watch is the one on Mac. And then I started banging out a list of ideas because one use case I had was simply, if you put a ZFS formatted disk on a Windows machine, can you have a simple command that prompts for, hey, import as an administrator and prompt for a key if encrypted and not much else. But I also noticed the moment I saw the screenshot, it's like, well, a lot of the day-to-day -day operations are pretty straightforward, but something like creating a DRAID pool on 60 disks is not something you might want to be doing through the through a simple tool like this. So uh, the closest analog I could find was the fact that, hey, someone's been working on a webmin package for quite some time, and there's a fork of it that's a little more active, and it remains to be seen if it's using libzfs or not. So uh, your thoughts, please. Is it only going to be used off the local system, or are you going to try and reach out and touch remote systems? Be nice. Uh, I see how that <laughs> might be useful on remote <laughs> systems, but it, it's initially very desktop oriented. But yeah, I, I, I yeah, that's a valid question. But I was hoping that, to start a little simpler than that. That, um, that, cha that changes the scope, and I get it because we yeah. do that because um, we're managing you know hundreds of different nodes of mm -hmm. ZFS. So how are you doing that currently? Any specific go-to thing, Ansible or otherwise? Oh, uh, there's there's some secret sauce. Okay. Um but it's all, you know, it's all very straightforward and, and literally what it comes down to is hey, run the command lines. Sure. Um okay. I you skipped ahead, but that's cool because I, I totally see <laughs> I how, yes, and for those present, that would be pretty important short of, you know, on your laptop, you probably can do it in your sleep. So there's that. Um, other thoughts and ideas and scope changing thoughts. <laughs> so regarding the minimal feature set, the really bare minimum would be the equivalent of ZFS and ZPool list. Uh, the status display so that you notify really nice to have would be notification on uh, warnings like read errors or at least check some errors and uh, especially notifications on uh, offline disks. Devices, of course. So basically pool health. Yeah. Uh, then the status, including watching the scrubbing status or the IO stat. Would be nice, but Visa I also would be the first thing I would put into the nice to have category, but the one which generates pretty graphs which would sell such a thing. Interesting. Two users. The, the the scrubs, o, yeah, the scrub status and the um resilver status would be fantastic. Yeah, then uh listing snapshots and if you have a bit of integration with the default file manager, it could, could just be XDG open for a file URL or something. Um, the option to basically open the root of a snapshot because using a graphical tool, it's often quite annoying to get into the hidden directory and some graphical applications just refuse to enter it because no, I double checked. Yes, I know you typed a path, but the file does not exist. I refuse but for an dot element. ZFS being yes, if dot ZFS is not, is not made more or less visible. Yeah. Some graphical tools and toolkits just refuse to let you navigate into it. And of course, on Windows, I know some lovely solutions have uh, shadow copy and pre you know Windows previous history 
integration, but I suppose this might want to have that too. Uh, well, as far um, what is it? The one that calls so, it the yeah. uh, their um, history thing that they do. Yeah, um, I know volume shadow copies. Yeah, I know that if you share with if you sift shares, we can integrate we integrate the stuff that way. Yeah. So if you're doing a local way of doing it, tying into that interface makes a lot of sense, at least to me. The other oh, thing that Sorry. the other thing that um about this whole thing that, that that kind of gets gets me and it's kind of in line with uh one of the comments there in meeting chat is most of this really feels like way too much for what I would expect to work well in an, a um, system tray service. Really, a lot of this stuff is more things that you don't need running all the time. It just needs to be an app that you run to deal with this stuff when you're ready to. So at least on Mac or as these trays are oftentimes a always available subset of the application and a way to have the application persist on your screen. So that there's always a way to reach it with the mouse without going through the file manager to open the application. Well, but that's, that's one of the, the weaknesses of oh. that's one of the weaknesses of Mac where you have to go through the file system to run most things if you don't no, have the list there. I mean it, it's the same on Windows. I don't have most I, I, Linux systems. And I don't have to go through the file system, system to start to start an application. Uh, VPN managers have... come to mind where you might have a simple little pop-up yeah. tray thing that then gets it as a massive configuration app. Just thinking out loud here. The, pro the, problem, yeah. is, the problem is we don't want to, pers as for a lot of this stuff, I don't want a persistent running thing ah. using up resources. There is no reason it would have to be the same process as so the persistent running thing would really be only the menu you open up, and as soon as you click something, it opens the application with the right arguments. At least but if I don't, if I, you know, if if there's really nothing on the menu that I am actively looking at, I don't even want to waste that. You will want a notification of a disk going south. You will want or read errors. You will, you know, that kind of something should be listening and notifying you. And yeah, I mean, you, run, you periodically run, you periodically run a check for that type of thing, but yeah, well, yep. I hear you, and there's a suggestion of a Zrepl GUI. Um, and did I capture your point that something like a pool creation is a one-time operation and sure doesn't sound like a system tray function? Or not just pool creation. A lot, a lot of a lot of this uh, a lot of this stuff doesn't seem like a system tray function. It seems more like mm. a just a periodic one off kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I hate to bring up a word, but it sounds like a configuration wizard. Oh boy, yeah. <laughs> Sorry yeah. to um oh, yeah, there are words there. So um... But for uh, less command line uh, savvy users to yep. basically expand the user base, help with pool creation because, as we all know, ZFS is kind of unforgiving if you lay out your pool badly. And so helping users pick a good configuration for their disk size and number. That sounds a lot would like would be a good time. reason, basically, just to have people know. Yes, I know that you have eight disks and there are sixteen terabytes for setting up your home nodes, and it's a really bad idea to really configure them as a RAID Z one because you want maximum capacity and something pretending to be redundancy. You mean RAID Z or say RAID Z one over far too many, far too large disks. To then basically have a, a thing 
annoy the user uh, and warn and try to um, right. lecture you get, you, them about right. the error of their way. Yeah. And you, and you get the customers, I want maximum number of space. I want the maximum amount of performance. They're mm -hmm. different answers based upon what your hardware is. So oh, yeah, Stripe they, will give you that, but you won't like it after a certain amount of time. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard that Dev Zero can write 100 gigabytes a second, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Multiple times. <laughs> Man, I'll read it's it. It's all the same anyways. Yep. Just restore from Dev Zero, right? Oh, okay. For, uh, uh, for something as painful as uh, um, the configuration wizard, what would a phone app look like? Would one want centralized notifications from multiple pools on different op on different platforms to call home, or is this purely a a direct attached storage question, or no. what? What, what? So that would be a push notification type of thing. So in my mind, I mean, that's there's no reason to go beyond that. I'm not going to fix the ZFS without hitting SSH from a phone. Cool. And it sounds like this is maps. Okay. Other random thoughts at this formative time? Where do we put it? Uh, and now, there we go. I think it's this one, right? Who would want such a thing? And on what operating systems would you? sit down and say, hey, that's great. And for example, have you heard of Zeta Watch on Mac, which I've been using, I've used ZFS on Mac for a decade. Um, I have I'm not heard. So you have a user. I am a user. Um, uh, for Windows, it would be, I confess on Windows, navigating those goofy physical one device names that you kind of have to extract out of W make output and all that is a nightmare. It's even a window, it's a nightmare on Windows itself where you go into format disks and disks are either online, offline, or sorry, I can't touch that disk that we know nothing is happening to. So plus Windows will let you like format your boot drive, which is quite impressive. <laughs> so I think the safety belts access angle is appreciated, but in all practicality, this conversation started with, okay, we just need to attach, decrypt a device or say backups or, mm -hmm. or so, some critical documents and then remove them and make that idiot proof insofar as you do it from the little tray rather than explain them Windows CFS commands. Go ahead, Jan. So you basically have two parts. So one would be the fairly, hopefully, small tray application, which would basically do the list and maybe as eye candy I.O. start like things. So basically list status and I.O. start equivalents. It would be kind of useful to have an option to snapshot a data set from it so that user can, can create and delete snapshots from a graphical interface. And the um, second component? And the second component would be the, basically the kind of management app, app which is a graphical, very, um, Recreation of the command line interface with a bit of hand holding and uh, guidance. Like how to lay out a pool. Um, Are which there properties do I want to set on this data set? Like, yes, enable LZ4, maybe don't configure gzip9. Yep. Uh, 
Any gut instinct well, responses to using something portable like Free Pascal Lazarus, which maybe you've never heard of, but it it's relatively proven, versus completely native uh, APIs, which could make this into like three or four or five different projects that hopefully share some common logic. And no opinion is a perfectly valid answer. I don't have an opinion because I wouldn't be the user base anyway. <laughs> or part of the user base. This is true. And I, I appreciate that uh, initial thought like, well, so how do we do it across our fleet of machines? <laughs> yeah, I mean, in, in, in fairness, I'm probably not who this is targeting either, even insofar as I'm interested in ZFS on Windows. Yeah, same same here. ZFS on Windows is much more important than being able to manage it from a workstation. Understood. Uh... And even the sheer practicality of getting people to test Jorgen's builds means it has to be easy <laughs> because these are mighty foreign concepts bringing all this sort of still, Unix history to people. Yeah. I still dream of a vet IO ZFS. Uh, oh, yeah. Virtualized Data driver. set pass through? Yes. Uh, while we have Mav oh. on the call, unless he, yeah, you're still here. Uh, any thoughts on the practicality and safety of, say, Vert.io ZFS, basically, uh, which would do data set passing to a VM? It would be basically, first of all, it would enable access to the file system content and would have an admin channel to forward admin commands. So, so that's how I would imagine it. But it's basically a way for a guest to send ZFS command invocations to the host to process there and then way to get the results back so that it would feel like I have access to a subset of a pool. Mm, so that's definitely interesting. Uh, well, I would separate two parts completely. One is just file system access and another is management. File system access uh, partially may be there uh, what is uh, your nine PFS or whatever? Yeah, there's your nine FS. PFS. There is NFS over VSOC. There is uh, the VIRTIO FS, which is basically fuse over VIRTIO ring buffers. No, fuse yeah, is probably but... implementation, but interface is VIRTIO FS. No, no. I think. Uh, the VET.io device is basically a VET.io, um, sorry, the, the VET.io device is basically a fuse server the kernel can mount, where the server isn't a user space process, but a, but a device. Oh, so the fuse server correct. runs on the host. And, you and said the NFS guest mounts it using the fuse protocol. VET.io SOC, is this correct, Jan? With uh, VSOC is a way to have something more or less looking like Unix sockets just with a numeric namespace. And you can use it for stream and datagram sockets uh, in QEMU and then uh, run NFS on top of that. At least uh, Red Hat has written experimental patches to implement this and the, the patches are small once you have vidio uh, vsoc and it's because then you have a trusted stream and you can run everything usable over tcp basically interesting including... would you then suffer from the nfs not a file system semantics yes. which prevent say air quotes databases like berkeley db from working well, NFS with locking, NFS before with locking and so on is is bad, especially if you're the only client, but yes. Okay. It would have the NFS semantics, which is why something like 9PFS uh, with 
the Linux and Unix extensions may be preferable, and Fuse can give you almost complete POSIX local file system semantics. So, yeah. Uh, but, go, uh, go ahead. Yeah. At least on FreeBSD, there is no implementation of this. For 9PFS, there is the server implementation in Beehive, but the FreeBSD client for it, the VetIO 9P uh, guest driver, has never been finished. Uh, Steve K says there are some patches to upstream from Juniper, so we are all yeah, staying tuned um, for that. We've been waiting for those for a long time. This is true, but they, they do exist. They just need gladly to test them if they compile this. Yes, okay. Um, is there anyone present who could architect this on a napkin note or otherwise? I mean, I, it, or is there another technology to model this after? I don't know if anyone wants to hear the, the four letters fuse, but um, um, this does QMU have a working Vert OFS that we can bolt on to uh, look at and emulate in ZFS? Not emulate, but reproduce. So, ah, there's some links here. Thank you for those. Paste. This is well. Okay. I'll paste them in the doc. So, okay, this that's probably not something we will settle today, but um, it's been coming up and it would be just elegant. Although Alan June made a point, so like what are the dangers of having a virtual machine have some kind of genuine file system access on the host? Um, Depends on how rich and precise the interface is, up to and including uh, anything a process on the host could do given the same permissions. Fair enough. And it would want, I guess, some inherent uh, jailing beyond perhaps what the a, an enclosing jail or virtual machine or otherwise will provide. Yeah. You would explicitly decide which data sets to make available. Sure. Okay, we are just past an hour's time. Any other thoughts and questions and ideas? And does this time slot work well for people? I, on one level, like the idea of changing every two weeks between this and that, but it's also a lot simpler to keep it simple. Change. What do you mean changing every two weeks? So the the OpenZFS leadership call uh, alternates between morning and afternoon to accommodate, say, Europe and Asia. And the this slot was chosen to better help people in, say, Australia. Not it's not perfect, but it helps. It's rather than like. 3 a.m. It's like 6 a.m. or something. Which, ah, uh, so there's that. And the later this goes, the more pressure that is on the East Coast folks in North America. So I'm I'm flexible. Um, so far, three meetings a week have been sustainable, but we shall see where that goes. Anyway, uh, I guess I'm I'm okay with this time slot if it's if it's changing every week. It is. It becomes much harder for me to keep track of. Agreed completely. And I, hopefully I, I, the calendar's working. It it unshared itself, so I'm I apologize for that. And I hopefully got it pretty working. Um, but yeah, I prefer fixed. Okay, so show of hands, any objection to this slot? If that works, we'll keep it and move on until further notice and conflicts. I'm enough of a night owl that it works for me. Awesome. And that's true of many of our colleagues. Uh, that's the eviction. And we should maybe look up the issues. We have an issue number, not to change subject. Okay, so from so, here uh, now, it'll stay this way. And uh, 
uh, that will have to work. And note that there are various upcoming conferences now that those are a thing again. So if there's an explicit conflict, I may just say, hey, see you online, see you on chat, et cetera. Um, up here was the issue. Issue, thank you. Let's try to get that. Maybe together we all look at that. Issues and boom. So circle back to this. Here was the uh, highly advanced data destruction that solves someone's use case issue. So the F alloc FL collapse range. Uh, so if anything, I'll put the full link in chat for those who celebrate such a thing. Uh, Stefan, I will mail you that script. And let me get this into the doc for posterity's sake. Um, but if I remember correctly, it's an uh, XFS and X4 only feature so far. Correct. And the question is, can we have it over here? So it's on the radar. Uh, that said, anything else? So I the F allocate man page for Linux documents that you have to have a multiple of your allocation size. So the request to truncate will fail if it's not the right size. And does that become a challenge with all the different configurable record sizes for CFS? For the user. Okay. Okay, everyone. You... Yeah. Cool. Well, speak now or forever hold your peace, or at least for a week. And it's been a pleasure. See ya. Excellent. Thanks all.